Yeah? We're having a grumpy grumpies today. I'm going to get a smile. Don't smile. Don't you dare smile. I love you. It's good to see you. All right. Hey, um, gosh, 4 H is happening. I've seen y'all are, are herding cats and, okay, I guess you don't really herd cats, but training cats and dogs and getting projects in and everything else. That's fun. We had vacation Bible camp. That was fun. Oh my gosh. The, the, and the summer's coming to an end really fast. Oh my gosh. Uh, schools are coming around the corner. But you know, today we're going to be talking about the Good Samaritan. Now, what is the Good Samaritan? Well, Samaria is a country. And this guy was from there. And there was a parable, which is a story, that Jesus told. And he said, this guy was going down the road, and he got beat up. And he was really hurting. And these two guys walked on by, and they said, oh, I don't have time for that. I've got important things to do. Oh, I, I, I can't help right now. I've got to be somewhere. Well, the third person was from Samaria. And that's why the story is called The Good Samaritan. And he saw the guy that got gotten beat up, and he needed some help. And so the guy broke out his first aid kit. Okay, probably not in Bible times. He probably like got some claws and stuff and wrapped it up. But broke out ancient time first aid kit. And he attended to his boo-boos. He attended to his wounds and, and wrapped him up and everything like that. And he got him to a place that could take care of him. And he says, hey, you know, I, I got places I got to go, but you take care of this guy, and I'm going to be coming right back by here, and I will pay whatever it takes to, to have taken care of him. I will take care of stuff when I get back. It's all going to be good. And the innkeeper said, okay, well, I'll, I'll do the best I can. Samaritan went and did his thing. He came back. He paid the whole bill. The guy got better, and away they went. Jesus asked him, he says, which one of those three really did the good stuff? The first two that, oh, I'm, I'm just way too busy. I can't do that. Or the third guy that took care of the wounded guy. Which do you think was the best one? The third one, wasn't it? Yeah. And you know what? He wasn't even from that, he wasn't even from that area. It'd be like somebody coming down the road here, whatever, from New York City or something. He was from far, far away. Well, Jesus wants us to do the same thing. If we see somebody hurting, Jesus wants us to kind of take care of them too. Maybe if they have boo-boos or something, we can offer them a Band-Aid. Maybe even one of our superstar Superman Band-Aids or something that, that makes things feel even much better. But you know, sometimes we're at school and we see somebody that's sitting by themselves at lunch. Maybe they need a friend. Maybe we see somebody struggling with a class or something. Maybe they just need a little bit of help. And we're really smart in whatever they need help in. Maybe, just maybe, we're on the sports page. We're, we're out playing soccer or basketball or baseball or softball or some other kind of sport. And we see somebody struggling just a little bit. We can say, hey, you know, I'd like to help. Even in church, we've got folks that maybe they're just a little bit sad. Or maybe they're just a little bit depressed or, or down or, or maybe they're afraid. You know, we can also pray for them. We can think about them. We can help them. You know, there have been lots of times that new people come into church and they don't know where to find stuff. You know, we can tell them, hey, you know, if you got kids, children's church is going to happen. And, and today, children's church is going to happen downstairs because that's where the air conditioning is working. Yeah. But, you know, maybe they can't find the bathroom. You know, come into a new place, you can't find the bathroom. You say, hey, bathrooms are back there or bathrooms are down here. You know, there's all kinds of ways to help that don't involve a first aid kit. And sometimes, I'll tell you a little secret, sometimes putting a big smile on your face and smiling at somebody that has the grumpy grumpies, <laughs> sometimes that smile is contagious and we can make somebody happy just by being their friend. Think that's pretty cool? I think that's pretty cool. And then of course we always want to share the gospel of Jesus. Always can share the story of Jesus being our friend and always being with us forever. Yep. <laughs>
Sing a new song.
in this place. Lord, there's so many things going on in the world that need your attention and we know that you are aware of every single one of them. There's things happening in our community that need your attention and Lord, we are aware that you know what they are. Lord, there's things going on in our church, there's things going on in our families, there's things going on in our personal lives that need your attention. And we know that you know all there is to know. Lord, you have heard our prayers. Those that we have lifted out loud, those that we have said in our hearts, minds, and souls, those that we aren't even aware of yet, that we're going to pray later. You've already heard them. You know us. You love us. You nurture and care for us. And Lord, for that, we are truly, truly thankful. So Lord, we ask, we seek, we knock, we beg, we plead, we, whatever it takes, we need you. Be with us this day and every day. Be with us our entire lives. Let us be your hands and feet in service, but also to be your children gathered around your ankles, wanting more. Be with us now, Lord, as we worship you through song and story, scripture and word, and also as we leave this place, let us worship you continually through our actions. Be with us, Lord, this day and every day. As we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they prayed, they should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I was younger, I used to wear witness wear a lot, okay? Um, probably started when I was in fifth, sixth grade. And if you're not familiar with what witness wear is, it's like um, Jesus t-shirts and Jesus hats and, and crosses around your neck. And, and sometimes you have earring crosses or cross earrings or, or something that way. Um, the modern generation seems to want to have Jesus wear permanently tattooed all over them, and that's okay. I love being on Team Jesus, because Team Jesus is pretty cool, because if you're wearing some kind of really eye-grabbing, mind-boggling Jesus t-shirt, somebody's going to ask you about it. I remember one of my favorites was, it had this giant cross and had this muscle-bound Jesus, 
And the cross was laying on Jesus' back, whatever, and it said, he lifts your sins, bench press this. And he was doing bench press with the cross, and it was this, he was agony and pain and, and all that went along with it. I wore that shirt out. I mean, holes in it were, and I was still wearing it because people come in and say, wow, powerful shirt, wow, cool shirt. And I got thinking about that much later in life. And thinking, was I really on Team Jesus or did I like the attention? Yeah. You know, we, we, we seem to do that a lot. We wear our faith out on our shirt sleeve somewhere, whatever, which is a dangerous thing because sometimes we get our feelings hurt if somebody crosses up what we actually believe. Well, what, what, what do you mean I'm, I'm supposed to believe this way or that way? I believe this way my entire life. And now you're saying that, that with new studies and new this and new that, we're supposed to change? God doesn't change. So sometimes we get our feelings hurt. We get our faith hurt. As a pastor, as I change from church to church to church, it's interesting to see the dynamics. Even in my current church, I've got two services, and the services are pretty much the exact same service. But boy, are they different. Going from a small country feel to more of a city institutional feel. Same people. I mean, it's interchangeable. Some of you folks will be in nor at North sometimes, and some of the North folks will be here sometimes. It, it's one congregation. But the feel is just a little different. But it's interesting that, that we all still claim to be Team Jesus. Maybe we don't wear the witness wear anymore. You know, I, when I'm out in public and everything, I like wearing my church shirt because it tells people, hey, he goes to Bethel because I'm really proud of Bethel. I'm proud of who Bethel is. I'm proud of what Bethel does. I'm very proud to be Bethel UMC pastor. And I want people to know that I'm the pastor of this amazing flock. But there's some people out in the world that are like, oh, you're a pastor. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what? Must be hard being a pastor in this day and age when nobody likes God, when nobody sees Jesus anymore, when nobody even wants to help their neighbors. Okay, y'all are living in a world that I'm not living in because I see good stuff all the time. I see people being awesome. All the time. Now, the Good Samaritan story talks about awesomeness, but also talks about giving some religious folk a little bit of a black eye. Let's hear these words again for the first time. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this expert in the law, okay, we're, we, we know lawyers. We know they have check marks and, and checklists, and, and they've got protocol, and they've got things all lined out, and they're ready for an argument. Now, I don't mean a fisticuff type argument, but they love a good debate. And they really don't care which side you choose. They'll gladly choose the other one and defend it even if they don't believe it. Here we go. Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Waiting for Jesus to say, you got to do this and this and this and this and this. And the lawyer's going, got it. That's all I got to do. I won't do any more. I'll do the bare minimum. Jesus doesn't get trapped. Jesus throws it back and says, well, what's written in the law? You are an expert in the law. What's in there? What's it say? How do you read it? And the expert said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That boils it down. That is every law ever, 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 ever. That's what Jesus stands for. That's what Jesus preached. That's what he taught. That's what Jesus lived Love God. Love everybody else. Jesus said, yep, yeah, that's right. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify him, so he said, ah, 
and just who is my neighbor? See, that's where we get caught up too. We get caught in this so badly. I love my neighbor. Oh, those people over there? Yeah, they don't live close enough to count. Oh, that, that group? <laughs> they're not part of my tribe, and, and so they're not my neighbor. We love to pick and choose. We love to find the loopholes. We love to find that, that out. I'm a Christian, except on days that end in Y. <laughs> I joke about that, but you know, we all know people like that, don't we? And don't look at other people and don't point fingers. But it is. What happened to Jesus so many thousand years ago still happens today. And so Jesus told this parable, and we know the parable inside out. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened by. He saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. You know, I think of that too, and I think of how many times that I've got these well lined out plans. This is what I'm going to do today. This is what I've got to accomplish today. Here's my checklist. And uh, get that phone call. Get that phone call. We need you at the emergency room in Evansville as fast as you can get here. We need you to come to Jasper as fast as you possibly can. Mama's not well. <clears throat> Pastor, can, can I come meet with you? My life is completely falling apart. I only need 10 minutes of your time. See, church 10 minutes lasts usually about three hours. The priest probably had some place to go. Had an agenda. Passed by on the other side thinking somebody else will take care. So the priest went on his way. And so to a Levite. Now the Levites, if you remember, were another religious order. And they were devout Christians. And they were, were into doing amazing things. They were there. He too saw the man and passed by. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came along and saw the man. And I just told the kids from another country, outside the world. Now, something that has come up, too, in my studies this week about Samaria and then the Samaritans, they weren't just foreigners and doing the thing. They were also religious outcasts. Because in that day, they were the Pentecostals. They had lots of loud music that they played. They stood and danced and waved their hands and, and they spoke God language, which we call speaking in tongues now. They were that folk, those folk. And I don't know if you've ever been to synagogue before, but Jews are quieter than Methodists when they pray and preach and, and everything. Their services are very quiet. The Catholic Church, whatever, the priest is the one who, unless it's a response, the priest is the one who has all the lines. The Samaritans, everybody worshipped as they felt the Spirit. And so not only was he a foreigner from another land, but he was also a religious outcast as well. Oh, he's one of those folks. We all know what happens. He heals the man, or he, he tends to the man, he puts him on his animal, he takes him to the nearest place and says, take care of him and I'll pay for it all. Jesus comes back and says, who was the neighbor? The expert in law says, well, the third guy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And so, there's stuff going on in the world. Duh. There's always has been. I remember growing up when we were having, um, uh, you know, you'd have tornado drills and fire drills and nuclear bomb drills. I can't wait to someday get one of those little metal desks we had in elementary school so I can just put it in my living room and have a bomb shelter right there in my living room. Because apparently if you crawl under your desk, 
the biggest nuclear bomb could drop right on the top of your school and you'd be okay. I'm not exactly sure what good those drills did, except to keep us busy for about 10 minutes crawling under our desks. Maybe that's how they mopped the floor back then. I just thought of that. I asked Caleb the other day, uh, on Thursday when we had the, the scare around town, we got home on Thursday night and said, buddy, I said, uh, you know, you okay? He said, sure. I said, well, there was some weird stuff happening around town on Thursday. I said, said you know, uh, um, you know where he says, oh, yeah, we all knew that, whatever, we, no big deal. There's a possibility of an active shooter in Washington, Indiana, and it's no big deal. Yeah, it's no big deal. So we, we, we practice for that. Says, if somebody comes in, you just... Drop dead and act like you're already dead. They won't shoot you twice. They won't waste the ammunition. What? Yeah, either that or you go hide. And as long as you're hiding better than everybody else, you'll be okay. Where'd you look? Where'd you pick this up? Thinking YouTube or sort of, oh, we do that at school every single week. We talk about these kind of things. My heart skipped a beat. Us parents, us adults at the, at the vacation Bible camp, those of us who had cell phones that were going off and going crazy and whatever, we were wigging out. We didn't know, I, mean, well, I went around, locked all the doors. I could just see parents coming in trying to get their kid and the doors are locked. Then they're wigging out. And I'm like, how, how do we protect our kids? And I got to the realization, the way we protect our kids, the best way to protect our kids is to teach them well, love them with everything we've got, and make sure they have Jesus in their hearts. Make sure that they're Team Jesus. Make sure that if they're the Samaritan walking down the road, they're going to stop and help when, when it's called to be. That they're the ones who are going to wear the witness wear and mean it. They're going to be the ones who are going to tell the stories to their friends and neighbors and whatever. And maybe, just maybe, their friends will understand and come along as well. They may never come into a church building. The next generation and the next generation, all the experts say that uh, sitting in rows and sitting in a building and whatever in the next five to 10 years is gonna be a thing of the complete past. And I'm sitting there going, I hope not. I enjoy this. I enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy the, fel the, the friendship. I enjoy the camaraderie. But they're saying that Team Jesus is going to be a hands-on active thing. That you're going to be going and doing ministry. That you're going to be assisting the neighbor. You're going to be loving on people. You're going to be... And just sitting here hearing a sage on the stage is going to be yesteryear, passe, thing of the past. We've got to be Team Jesus. No, I'm not saying that we all get matching shirts and sing Kumbaya down to City Hall and do something weird. But we all got to be ready to help that person, whoever that person is. Maybe it's a mom, maybe it's a dad, maybe it's our next door neighbor, maybe it's somebody in the family or out of the family, maybe it's a complete stranger. But we need to be ready. We need to know our stories, we need to know who we are and whose we are, and we need to be on board. Yeah, there's stuff happening in our denomination. There's stuff happening in our local church. There's stuff happening in our community. There's stuff going on. And I'm to the point that I'm done worrying about it. I'm done worrying about dead air conditioners. I'm done worrying about dead refrigerators. I'm, I'm done worrying about where money's going to come from and where people and personnel's going to come from. I'm going to worry more about what our mission is. Make disciples change the world. Tell people about Jesus and invite them to come along for the ride. Be Team Jesus. And take on the world as a team, as friends, as comrades, as people who believe. Priest, Levi, Samaritan, they were all religious people. They all had agendas, they all had patterns, they all had things that were going on in their lives, and they all had things to do. 
Jesus told the expert, be a neighbor. Love God, love others, and you'll be okay. If that advice from Jesus was good enough for the legal expert, I'm pretty sure it's good enough for us. So love God, love your neighbor, and be a neighbor to those around you. Amen. Just like any team of any sport of any kind, 
we do our job. Our job as Christians is to A, love God with everything you've got. B, love yourself because we're called to love others as we love ourselves. Forgive you, bless you, love you, and then go into the world and share that love with others. All love comes from God. All love comes from God. Be that God love to whomever you meet today. Go, Team Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I ask blessings to be upon us all. Amen. Amen.